this time. Uh, Probably not. But anyway, we're live now. So, hey, hey everyone. Right. We're going to be um, discussing Syria because it's a horribly complicated mess and yeah, it's <laughs> to figure out what's going on. Uh, so, I'm talking with Hobbyist Contrarian. His blog's linked in the description. Yeah, um, I'm just looking, some fuck, fuck on Twitter who keeps there. getting invited on live streams. <laughs> uh, right, okay, so you think Assad did the 2013 Ghouta attack, is that correct? Well, I wouldn't say it with a huge amount of confidence, but I'm, yes, I was prodded to look at it by vernaculus, and I reasoned Assad, I think, did Al Ghouta. Lots of qualifiers there. Okay, uh, why do you think that? No, I just want to say that I don't think he did 2013 in Ghouta, but um, I, I think we, I think it's best to get get all of this out of the way. Um, we oh, both yeah, we should start that. Assad... I, I wrote the, the first blog post on Al Ghouta to get it out yeah. of the way first, because so you kind to, of have to do it. Just to um, explain to everyone, I, I think that we both agree that Assad is probably a bad man. <laughs> bad things. Um, the question isn't whether Assad is a decent guy or any of the sorts. It's more the weapons he's using to be a bad guy with. Um, I am not convinced that he's used chemical weapons, but I mean he uses conventional weapons all the time. Well, so what's the difference, really? But well, yeah. Um, so the first thing that happened after Al Ghouta was um, the UN investigation. I think. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting to note because the UN investigators were already in Damascus at the time of the attack. That's interesting. Yeah, they were there. Uh, da -da -da -da. They'd been sent there three days earlier to investigate another chemical attack <laughs> in Khan al Assal. Mm -hmm. um, and see, this is the weird thing Assad must have known this. So why the fuck would he? What? See, I'm no, agreeing with you here a bit. Why the fuck would he gas his own it? city? It, it's totally beyond reason, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's really stupid. So there's holes everywhere you look at it. Yeah, and the, the, well, let me let me um, lay out my case. For some reason, the way back. Oh, okay. So it looks like the the Daily Mail article. There was a, there was an article in the Daily Mail. About how the Daily Mail. Yes, I know the Daily Mail, but uh, you're going to quote me articles from places like CNN and whatnot. And honestly, I'm I not actually. I, I, well, you know what I mean. Mainstream sources that I honestly don't find any more reputable. So that's fair enough. I've, I've heard they just lie about. They're not really. No, they're not. I know they they just lie about different subjects. Um, okay, the the article on the Daily Mail is gone. Uh, and it's gone from the Wayback Machine as well, which is very interesting, isn't it? I mean, why would people, why would anyone want to remove that? Mm. So there was a leaked email to say that the U.S. to suggest the U.S. was considering orchestrating something, and uh, then we ended up getting a Turkish whistleblower, uh, an opposition MP from the Tur Turkish government, who claims to have an audio recording of the Turkish intelligence services arranging the transfer of sarin gas to... Ah, uh, yes, Turkey's a very interesting... It is. Um, um, and uh, combine that with the complete lack of rational action, if it was Assad committing the attack, I would be... I mean, I, I would have trouble believing that was the case, and I well, find it a lot more credible that someone's trying to set him up. Yeah, well, I think that the rebels probably had sarin. I think that they... they did. They certainly did. I think that they did. And again, with Turkey, um, one of my most useful sources in this was an article adaptation of a book by Rhys Ehrlich. Right. Um, I will, hang on, I will put it in the chat. Yeah, well, I'll, ta I'll, take, your, I'll take your word for it. I, I'm, I'm convinced yeah, well, you're He talks things. about what happened. Yeah. Um, da, 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 da. I'm just trying to... And he... He says that it appears Al-Qaeda-affiliated rebels, I'm quoting now, mm -hmm. had the expertise and capability to carry out small-scale chemical attacks. Mm -hmm. And this seems to ring true, because the attacks over the year of 2013, there were seven, confirmed by the UN, Sarin, uh, they fell in both rebel and government-held areas. So, yeah, it looks like the rebels might have had Sarin. 
And we, actually, we actually know they had Siren because they captured a Syrian government stockpile. Yeah. Uh, let me just tell you the year. The, the date. But I'm, there is a paragraph in here. Um, oh, fuck. Ah, here we go. In late May, Turkish newspapers reported that suspected members of Al Nusra were arrested carrying two kilograms of sarin with plans mm -hmm. to attack the US Air Force Base at Adana, Turkey. By the time the case came to trial, however, the Turkish <laughs> the Turkish government be those brownies. The Turkish government did not prosecute the men for possessing sarin. There's no public record of why. Mm. Well. Why, why wouldn't they? And yes. the the, um, the rebels, Al Nusra specifically, uh, c supported by foreign jihadis, mostly mm. from Libya, uh, captured a Syrian government base that had, in in, in addition to the numerous uh, just conventional weapon stockpiles, uh, large amounts of mustard, chlorine, and sarin gas. And yeah. the um, the fighter who uh, th this was a report from a fighter who took part in it. And he said that the Al Nusra took this island specifically. Uh, in another incident in late May, mm. Iraqi authorities arrested five alleged members of the Islamic State for building two labs to manufacture sarin and mustard gas. <laughs> I didn't know about that. I'm, I'm not yeah. surprised. I'm... Well, this is from this. It's a really good article. I thought it was really useful. Mm. Mm. Um, so, yeah. The rebels had sarin, and they had the capability to carry out at least small-scale attacks. Um, I think more importantly, that, well, not more importantly, but also to add to this, they, they certainly have the motive. Yes. Interestingly, for Al Ghouta, Assad had a motive as well, though, which was okay. he wanted to clear that city. Right, okay, but why wouldn't he just do, do it with conventional weapons? Well, because in a city fighting is a is a fuck, isn't it? Well, yeah, but chemical weapons aren't really very effective. That's the main I, problem with them. Really? You could clear... Really? I you mean... Could, no, no, they're, they're really horrifically inefficient. Um, the, I'm just thinking, if I was Assad, and um, I was this great real politicking, fighting a civil war, trying to hold my country together, I would have no problems gassing a city if I... <laughs> Revealing my own morals here. I would well, gas a city well, uh, the if I could spare several hundred of my own men. Yeah, but that, that's that's the problem. I mean, he, he, you know, none of these are actually gassing of cities. They're small scale chemical attacks that kill a handful of people. I mean, none of well, them have yeah. even killed a hundred people in a single attack. So it's it's really, I mean, it's a lot of time and effort for something that doesn't actually have much payoff. If you sent a dozen men with assault rifles into a city, you could end up with hundreds dead. Whereas, yeah, but they would all be killed as well as the thing. Well, not necessarily. He had, <laughs> and I mean, and this is just like you know a, a small sort of suicide squad. You know, if you if you sent in like you know a division or a regiment or something, the the it would be way more effective. Oh, yeah. See, this is the difference between Khan Shakun and Al Ghouta. Al Ghouta was under the control of um, Al Ghouta was somewhere that he was trying to recapture at that time. Yeah. So. And it was but also I, much I, larger I, I, than Khan yeah, Shakun, we can um, remember that. And another, another problem with chemical weapons, they're unpredictable on the battlefield. If he's in the middle of trying to recapture it, using chemical weapons is a risk to your own soldiers. Yeah. Well, um, but not, not only that, I think that that's... I, I, find, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not beyond the realms of possibility. It's not a ludicrous thing. To Nothing say. here is beyond the realms of absolutely, possibility. Yeah. That's what's so annoying. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I don't find that to be beyond the realms of possibility. But it would be so short-sighted. Well, it, it's, it, it wouldn't be very effective. Um, it, it and again, going back to it, the it wouldn't achieve a strategic goal. It might be a tactical victory, but it wouldn't achieve a strategic goal. It would and again, going goal. back to the three UN investigators that were already there. Yeah, exactly. Well, I did speak to Vernaculus about this. I tweeted him. Um, we came to the same conclusion, which is he doesn't have to be stupid. He just has to be reckless. Yeah, but I don't think he is reckless. I don't, I don't think you can afford to be reckless in the situation he's in. I think that it's reasonable to think, though, if he did do it, it's reasonable to think that he was just calling the, US, the US's bluff, because the Obama administration was hostile 
to Assad, even though it never really tried to remove him, with the exception of possible bombings in 2013 after al Ghuta, he probably thought he could get away with it. And, provided he did it, he did get away with it, didn't he? Yeah, I don't agree with the... The premise, which is that he did it, I know. Yeah, I... I, I th this is... I'm, I'm just... I mean, like, they'd already said that the red line was use of chemical weapons. Um, and he thought, because he knew that the US population was exasperated. But anyway, th this is all conjecture, yeah, um, down I to facts. That, because I what what I mean is, like, the, the thing is, I mean, the, the United States isn't shy about knocking off Middle Eastern dictators who aren't allied with the US. So yeah. It, I, I can't imagine from Assad's point of view, he was looking at this and thinking, I may as well gamble it. I mean, but, that, that seems like... That uh, seems hatred, like well, no, exasperation at foreign intervention was one of the things that put Trump in power. Yeah, but... It wasn't a huge amount of... So the military-industrial complex will operate with or without Trump's permission, basically. With, with or without the electorate's permission. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a real problem with the United States. Um, but uh, honestly, I don't think that Assad could reasonably have concluded that he could use chemical weapons and not expect US intervention. But he did... No, I'm not going to say that. Well, that's the uh, thing. He isn't might it? have you, used chemical weapons. You seem to be predicating on this on... I know, I know, I know, nerves. I know. I know. I'm just making the point that um, he could have been calling bluffs. Oh, he could, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm not saying... That, like I said, I think it's entirely... I mean, it's possible that that could have happened. But, I mean... If, the, the it's problem a gamble. Is, he I, could yeah, have it's a, it's a, yeah, but it's a crazy gamble. You know, it's especially when he didn't need to. Um, so let's strengthen your argument to start with. Um, sure. Oh, wait, no. Whose argument am I strengthening here? I think it's mine. <laughs> well, yeah, just, just let's have the information. We'll see what... All right. Happens. So um, the UN report mm -hmm. was not tasked with identifying a perpetrator. Mm. This is the thing. This is the first thing I looked at because I wanted to find out what happened. Just facts, facts, facts. Let's not talk about blame, what happened. Um, the, the UN collected, uh, on the basis of evidence obtained during our investigation of, of the Guter incident, the conclusion is that on 21st of August 2013, chemical weapons have been used in the ongoing conflict between the parties in the Syrian Arab Republic also against civilians, including children, on a relatively large scale. In particular, the environmental, chemical, and medical samples we've collected provide clear and convincing evidence that surface-to-surface -surface rockets containing the nerve agent sarin were used. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the UN conclusion. An attack happened. Mm -hmm. It wasn't tasked with finding blame. And mm -hmm. as I'm sure you know, the, the team itself was conflicted over... Who did it? Yeah, the, the Carla Del Ponte thought that the rebels were responsible. Yeah, and it reached no conclusion, the, the paper they published. It wasn't tasked with reaching a conclusion. No, no, I know. I know. Um, so, we know that the attacks happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The use of surface-to-surface -surface rockets seems to back up the White House story, which therefore points towards Assad. Why, why do you feel that... Uh... How could the rebels have got surface-to-surface -surface rockets? They do. They use them all the time. Well, yeah, yeah. These. I'm just running through. Um, yeah, so they, 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 they do the the surface-to-surface -surface rockets, and they do use them regularly. The white, the Human Rights Watch ran its own investigation. This is the point where it narrows it down. The kind of rockets. The Human Rights Watch decided that the surface-to-surface -surface rockets, it was a rocket system of, of approximately 330 millimeters, likely Syrian produced, and a Soviet era 140 millimeter rocket system to deliver a nerve agent. Mm -hmm. uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, these weapon systems known and documented to be only in the possession of and used by Syrian government armed forces. Human that's rights watch and arms though. experts. Well, I mean, we, we, we literally know that's false. Uh, it's the kind of rockets. Yeah, I know. There is let another thing here. Let, Hang let me on. Finish. Because the rebels have captured vast amounts of munitions from the Syrian government. Um, 
we're, what we're talking about is an analysis of the rockets that we used specifically. Yeah, I this, know, this I know. Human but rights, what I'm saying is something else which I really want to come on to here. But what I'm saying is it's not just the Syrian government that I know, I'm about Syrian to back up your own. arguments. Um, so, what do you know about Theodore Apostol? Nothing. Nothing, really? Oh, you're in for a treat. He's... Um, He's a weapons expert. He is Professor Emeritus of Science, Technology, and National Security at MIT, right? Mm -hmm. um, he's basically one of the foremost experts in the field of weapons. Mm -hmm. And he took it upon himself to shred the White House narrative in both 2013 and he came back and did it again in 2017. Right, okay. And what was his conclusion? Well, he analysed the rockets. Here's, here's the thing. He offered a competing analysis of the rockets that we used. Mm -hmm. And he concluded that they were propelled by Soviet-era grads, uh, which are a common ground-to-ground -ground rocket system possessed by both the Syrian government and the rebels. Mm -hmm. So what we have is an analysis by the Human Rights Watch that says only the Assad regime had these rockets. And then we've got another analysis by a weapons expert that says, no, these are different rockets, and both sides had them. Well, I'm more inclined to side with that, because that also aligns with other facts that we have. Yeah, and he says, the maximum range would have been no more than three kilometres, and probably less. Mm -hmm. Which is very different from the Human Rights Watch, because... Uh, they plotted the rocket's trajectories, supposedly, I don't believe them, which showed that they intersect at a, a regime fortress called Mount Quezon or something, right. which is nine kilometers away. So the idea is, if the Human Rights Watch is right with these rockets and with their trajectories, they were fired from a, a regime fortress right in the middle of government-held territory nine kilometers away from the site, so that pretty much casts. They, they that must pretty think much. The Syrians are stupid. That's what the Human Rights Watch thinks. Yeah, they they, mu they must think that the Syrian government is run by morons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's fire rockets from the middle of a huge fortress. <laughs> that, that's actually insulting to hear, isn't it? Just to, to the layman on the outside of this. Yeah. I mean, come on. So, yeah, competing facts. Competing facts. Yeah. You've shaken my conclusion. I'm not sure I think Assad did it anymore. Well, it's I, I'm not. I don't really care whether he did it or not. That's the thing. Yeah. I just care if it's true. And then, I, just, I mean, honestly, I, think, me. I, I wish that more people would pay attention to the, the Turkish MPs who were saying, look, we have recordings of our intelligence services oh. organizing with the rebels, you know, and it, it's something that bothers me that nobody seems to want to listen to. I'll tell you what interests me. It's, um, it's how the West is so convinced that Assad did it. It's kind of scary. Oh, it's our media halo. That's, it's, it's, it's because our media is incredibly lazy. It's basically state propaganda at this point. Mm, when it comes to why. anything outside of the West, it's effectively state propaganda. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not, it's not a joke. It's, yeah, they, um, they, what they do, they don't, they don't send journalists. I, they, mean, I mean, CNN and ABC and all the big networks have been scaling back their investigative journalist capabilities and just reducing the size of these teams. It's, and what they do is they just take government reports, government statements. The government has said yeah, this. It's scary because I looked into these attacks. Some of the things I was reading in news articles I knew were false, and I knew there was other information out there that the authors didn't have. It's mm -hmm. scary. I thought, holy shit, how are journalists this stupid? It's the first time I've really realized it. it. It's not the stupid. I think it's that they're lazy. That's what I think it is. I think it's the path of least resistance. If the government is, is putting forward one narrative and everyone in the government is supporting this narrative, which they obviously will do, and the, there are other journalists who think, well, if I just go along with this, I can, I can point to the authority of the government and say, well, what are you saying? Our intelligence services are lying. Whoa, um, why would they do that? I am, I am saying that directly. If there is anyone from the intelligence services listening, you are liars constantly. You need but to stop it. We, if we look at just the way that they reacted to Khan Shaikun, President Trump immediately went and labeled it reprehensible and heinous. Rex Tillerson went further. Assad operates with brutal, unbashed barbarism. Mm -hmm. um, 
he went on to make that stupid Nazi comparison. <laughs> so, yeah. it entertains me that the US is run by such competent, intelligent people. Uh, well, the, it is, but they're not holding elected offices. Mm. Um, but yeah, so um, the, the Khan Sheikh Hoon one, then. Let's, uh, let's talk about that, because all right. I think uh, we've covered Guta there. Um, let me just go well, on yeah. But yeah, do, do you want to give um, a, a rundown of... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Khan Shikun in the Idlib province, which is under the control of Al Nusra, uh, allegedly attacked using chemical weapons. Uh, we've got... I just started with a few interviews and shit. It was like a winter fog, said Mariam Abu Khalil. Uh, when they got out of the car, they inhaled the gas and died. The white helmets... Yes, I know, a suspicious source reported that the victims were panting, vomiting, and foaming at the mouth. Mm -hmm. And they said that the four explosions, this is the white helmets, were unusually weak because they thought it was a conventional attack and they thought the explosions were suspiciously weak. Mm. So that implies chemicals. Uh, da -da -da -da. The Union of Medical Care and Relief Organizations, which funds hospitals in rebel held areas, said three of its own staff were affected by the attack and that victims were experiencing the effects of sarin. Mm -hmm. Now, this is annoying because this is all we have. Um, you did a great thing where you went through all the video evidence and you said, you know, a lot of these videos are fake in yeah. the investigation you did. Yeah. And it's this is why I wanted to get that UN article for Al Ghouta, because we have something relatively credible we have the un saying this happened an attack I, happened I, I never mind blame it I, happened I think, we don't even know that with khan shakun uh, no, that, that's a, i'm glad you went there because with, with like as you say with guta i'm i'm convinced that it did happen the question is who made it happen um but I, like you say with khan shakun we're not even sure and we I, honestly i don't trust the french report at all I mean, I'm not even sure their military intelligence is up to date because, as far as, according to the French report, this would have this would be happening in territory that the Syrian forces have already captured. Yeah. So the so UN why released a statement. Hard gas behind his own lines. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just again. It, it just you'd have to believe that Assad is some sort of gibbering madman. <laughs> he's not. You know, you can listen to him. No, I, I saw the interviews. Not. He's definitely not mad. No, he's a very he's clearly an intelligent man and he clearly has a deep understanding of the geopolitical knowledge of the area. So it's hard to believe that he would be like, well, maybe I'll just gas behind an area I've captured. I mean, he, to what end? I thought he had in that interview a kind of deceptive intelligence, if you know what I mean. Go on, what do you mean? I mean the things he said, the way he conducted himself, um the way that he was making flat denials, I said that um, I thought he had those formidable powers of denial that Ronald Reagan was credited with. I thought it was just sort of cunning of him and deceptive -y and it's just my character analysis is mm. all. You see, kids, when I, when I look at him, I, I, look, I see a man who's scared. I, I see a man who is, who is desperate to not be lied about that's that's just how he comes across he seems the the way he the way he um he has everything he needs to say he he's got it down in his head you know he knows exactly why he's saying what he's saying and he builds a co coherent picture with what he with with the narrative he's he's painting yeah, i see and, that and, and for me i'm just thinking okay so if you were in a position where a giant hostile power was I mean, and it's public knowledge that the U.S. wants regime change across the Middle East. It's wanted regime change in years in Syria. It's just exactly. never really had the impetus. Exactly, and suddenly they're fabricate. I mean, we know that there are the people from like the White Helmets and whatnot are fabricating videos, fabricating images. People have been arrested for doing so, and you know this, and sudden, and you probably are aware that Turkish intelligence is interfering as well they've yeah. already tried to pen pin a gas attack on you that isn't actually your fault and i think i honestly i think that we can probably suggest that the guter attack would would be down to the rebels i think that we He's, can be 
reasonably doing, sure of this. He's doing very well under pressure, isn't he? Well, that's the thing. If that were me, I'd probably be begging. I'd probably be saying, listen, right? They're trying to fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, and but I mean, obviously, I'm not a sad, and I don't know what he thinks. But I was just, I was just watching, thinking, man, he looks nervous. You know, he looks like a man who, it's especially with the way this war has divided the entire Middle East, it's not just Syria. Oh yeah, absolutely. This is this is another thing. I mean, he he made that point in his in one of his interviews, where he's saying, look, it's things that happen in Syria don't just stay in Syria. You know, because the Middle East is effectively a large open area with very few natural formations. You can just walk or drive, obviously. Um, you know, yeah, it's... But um, I, I'm down to my bit. Um, not everything he said was unreasonable in that interview. Hmm. And I thought he raised some really good points. This is why yeah. I don't have a conclusion on Khan Shakun. We differ over Al Ghuta. I don't know about Khan Shakun. Well, do we even differ about Ghuta? That's the thing. It's. I mean, I, I'm not saying I conclusively know, but from what we have... I would be more inclined to think the rebels would be the ones. Well, who I'm would. just. But more... with Khan Shakun, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I mean, I, I yeah. literally don't know. I, I don't. Think like, that... I don't even know if the attack took place, let alone whether Assad did it. But well, again, it, it yeah. just seems to defy logic. The UN released a statement on April fourth where they said we're not currently in a position to investigate this. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, at least they can be honest. Organization. I, I no, no, but at least they can be honest about it. I mean, I. Yeah. I've, and they like, said they, um, they don't give us any information about how they collected their samples. Yeah. They don't give us any information about like they, they said they, we can't investigate this. We recommend you look at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. They're looking into it. Trust them. Yeah. Now the OPCA OP, OPCW, their findings started to come out on April nineteenth, which was yeah. after most of the Assad interviews. It was after. A lot of stuff. It was it was one of the later pieces of evidence to come out. Mm -hmm. But they said, you know, biomedicinal samples, three victims, autopsy, uh, analyzed at two laboratories. The results indicate the victims were exposed to sarin or a sarin-like substance. Biomedical samples from seven individuals undergoing hospital treatment were also analyzed. Similarly, they indicate sarin. So, and the Director General said, while further details of laboratory analysis will follow, the analytical results already obtained are incontrovertible. So, the OCPW reckons it was sarin, at the very least. They reckon sarin was deployed in Khan Shakun. We're still not on to blame. No, but I mean, I'm happy to believe it could have been. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that it couldn't have happened. But well, I mean, here's why I think it did happen. It's because uh, a Guardian, the first Western journalist, he was working for the Guardian, so, mm -hmm. but he was a Western journalist, so better than anything we could have got from Syria, even though not entirely trustworthy. Mm. Uh, the first Western journalist to reach the area was Kareem Shaheen, two days later. So there was a two-day gap, but there was a Western journalist at the attack site not that long after it happened. Hmm. And he says, it was a Guardian exclusive. He said that, you know, he saw the crater, he saw lots of dead bodies, and he talks about one chap, Abdul Hamid al Yusuf, had rushed to help the other victims. He came back instead to find that much of his family had perished, including siblings, nephews, and nieces. Hmm. His wife and children had rushed down to the bomb shelter in their basement only for the toxic gas to seep into it. That evening, he insisted on carrying his two infants in his arms to bury them himself. Almost in a trance, Yusuf repeated the children's names, choking as he did so. So that's, um, I think, there's a reasonable, that's quite compelling evidence that something happened. That, and it wasn't a false I, flag. I, I could, I mean, uh, presuming any of, you know, the, the, the reports are true, which is what we have to assume. Well, yeah, there's one journalist. He was from the West, and he only got there two days later. But the things that he saw, if he reported them honestly, seem to indicate that an attack did happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, that, that, but there's a lot of provisos in there. Yes, that's the that's the thing. I mean, again, if I'm he, happy to believe that a chemical attack took place, 
But I think it's a bit too early to start pointing fingers. Of course it is. Um, and the, the, but not for the not for U.S. government, not for but Western we media. know so little, and already so much has happened because of it. Yeah, yeah. Like the missile strike. Um, Vladimir Putin blocked a UN resolution condemning it. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, info wars turned on Trump, almost as significant. <laughs> yeah, I, I found that amusing too. And I've actually, I thought it was so amusing. I've embedded that Paul Joseph Watson tweet. Do you know what's really interesting about that though? Is the um, I, I, honestly, I, I, I actually do think that Trump is playing 4D chess now. That was that was actually a genius move. That he by seems to be in I, some I, respects. I, I can't believe it was just a mistake. Or, a bun, you know, he bungled into yet another lucky move that in the end he came out the winner at. I've, um, I'm actually researching for another blog post on this. Um, there's a lot of the things Trump are doing do, do seem to be quite tactical. Like um, the way he's using the media. It's incredible. He's yeah, it's, it's clever. It's actually clever. <laughs> And the way he's, it's called spatial leadership. It's a real academic theory. Oh, really? The way he's distancing himself from the government. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way he's creating distance between himself and the government. Mm -hmm. And he's portraying himself as some noble hero. And he's personal. He's a real man. This is the thing that a lot of Hillary supporters don't understand. Oh, Trump, he's rich. He's a billionaire. How can he be the champion of the people? Well, mm -hmm. people think that he's their champion. He's making them think that he's their champion because he's personal, because he's tweeting at them, because he's going to all these rallies. Yeah, he I mean, is a populist, he, and he's doing it very well. He legitimately is, though, in, in that regard. People people want someone who is going to talk to them rather than talk yeah. to the people in between. Even them. if it's not genuine. And I don't know if it's genuine. No, I don't either. He's doing it as a strategy. as a, Even as an electoral strategy, he's yeah. doing it. Isn't it fascinating that he's still doing rallies? He never, yes. That's um, crazy. Why would you need to do that once you've won? Because he wants to keep appearances up, I imagine. This is how he intends. I think it was one of Ronald Reagan's aides who said the White House was like a permanent election campaign mm. for the whole eight years of his presidency. Trump's doing something similar. And he's. Well, he has to with the media ranged against him. And, um, the rest of the US government is faceless. It's impersonal. It's mm. monolithic. And he's pitching himself against it, like he's mm. the people's champion, brought down by the greater strength of lesser men. Uh, that's that's how he can explain away all of his failures. It's the greater strength of lesser men. It's very clever. But, but, and, well, you say that. I mean, many many people on the ground do think that Trump has been essentially co-opted by the deep yes. state. Um, I can see why they think it, too. There's Breitbart, I wrote a Breitbart article on his first hundred days, how the liberal establishment, blah, 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 globalists, blah, 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 have been conspiring to stop Trump. You know, the deep state, have you seen the Ben Garrison cartoons with um, the deep state just stopping Trump? Actually, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, well, I, I'm surprised I've seen a lot of his cartoons go around and I haven't seen that one. But um, the, the strike on Syria that he did, I, I thought it was going to be a massive blunder when I first saw it saw you know the reports of it coming in but afterwards the, the fallout was incredible the the media were lionizing him glenn greenwald was losing his mind over it you know trump acts like a neocon for five seconds and suddenly the media are falling over him um oh, obvious has just dropped out i'm sure he'll be back there we are um yeah so the media are falling over him he's struck syria but done yeah, no I real damage just disconnected and reconnected yeah, uh, no problem. I'll just finish off this thought. Like he he struck Syria and done no real damage, and the backlash to him striking Syria has made it appear that there is popular resentment to intervention in Syria. So if people say, "Well, you should go and over overthrow Assad," he can say, "Well, the people don't want that," and he can it, legitimately point to a source of activist contention on the internet. And that is a gamble, though. Once again, that is a gamble because well, of course, again, he lost the support of quite a lot of the people who helped put him in office when he did yes, that. Yes, but he, they're not... I mean, yes, but the thing is, they're not very powerful people. Uh, even as a group, they're not very powerful. Um, certainly not in the this, this situation Trump's in now. They're, they're definitely... Well, InfoWars didn't really desert him in the end. It just sort of teetered. 
Yeah, but the the point is, essentially, Trump came out of this smelling like roses. Everyone was at each other's throats, but nobody was really that angry with Trump. Uh, sort of. I, I think still did. think there's anger at him for going back on his non-interventionist campaign oh, promise. Well, I, I agree, but this effectively wasn't an intervention. It was basically rattling a saber. Yeah, I think, I think his motivations are more human than that. I think we have to remember our politicians are not gods, they're people, and they feel and they think like we do. Hmm. I think, because he's 70 and he's a family man, hmm. I think that someone came to him, some aide with those pictures, whether they were faked or not, well, there was a, there was those. a report, uh, not a report, but um, his yeah. son, Eric, is it? And Ivanka. Uh, Ivanka. Ivanka. Yeah, yeah. Well, his, his uh, er, Eric, I, th I think his name is Eric, um, he had actually said to, uh, I can't remember which media out there. I remember was, reading this, yeah. Yeah, that, that Ivanka had a lot of influence over his, her father, and she had said, but think of the Syrian children, Daddy. <laughs> um, I think that's a horseshit story. I think that's Do you? Yes, absolutely. I don't. I think that Trump had an emotional reaction to the things that he saw, and that's mm. why he ordered the strike. I, I don't think so. I, I think that the strike was a calculated move because it, it, uh, did, it did nothing to impede the military capabilities of the Syrian army, really. Uh, well, they, they, were, they were launching planes off that very airstrip the next day. It, yes, did, it did nothing um, to Syria. It did nothing to the geopolitical situation in the Middle East, and yet it basically whipped everyone at home into uh, having large groups of people not uh, agitating not to invade Syria and the media praising him for a day. Assad, in his interview, the interviewer asked him, is it true 20% of your, of your air force has been destroyed? And he looked at them blankly like he was confused and he'd never seen that statistic before. And he was yeah, like, yeah, no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, and the, uh, the Russian story as well was just... That was, was bullshit. Such, um, it was so pulled out of their asses. I just, I look, I gave one look and just dismissed it. You don't no, know. I only gave it a paragraph or so. Yeah, it, it just wasn't worth contemplating. And it was, it, and the destroying 20% of their air force, like Trump came out and said that. And, I think he said, um, I didn't note it down. He said something to the effect of quite a lot of our planes were destroyed, but they were all old and shit. And it hasn't really <laughs> impacted our ability to wage war. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it, it, obvious nonsense is being thrown around there. Um, but yeah, ba basically, it didn't. It was it was a non-event, and yet everyone treated it I, like it was a major event. It was. I really think it's, it's funny how Assad himself re refuted the Russia story because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he talked about how the attacks took place at different times, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. he actually said. Yeah, these these were different times. The Russia story makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, and th th this is this is the thing. You, it's <sighs> knowing what to believe is really difficult. So, I mean, but you can point to several obviously bullshit stories. Yeah, yeah, you you really can, and it's it's genuinely worrying for me as well because I mean I, I'd really like to go into the um, the white helmets if you'd like to talk about them. Um, I don't know very much about the white helmets. Um, I wouldn't be much use. I would rather talk about the problems that I had with the Assad interview. Sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. Because I which, said, which one? this is where we were before we went on that the, huge the, Trump The one that was uh, done about a month ago, do you mean? <laughs> yeah, um, this is where this is what I was about to do before we had that huge Trump dera derail. Um, I said, yeah, not everything was on, there's a midge there. Uh, he raised some good points about the strange timing, and mm -hmm. you know, he had no motive. And the fact that if the regime had chemical weapons, it should logically have used them earlier. Those are good points. There were times where it would have been better for the regime to use chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. Why would it do it then? So, yeah, this is just contradictions, contradictions. But I did have a few problems. Um, mm -hmm. He says, you know, the first thing he says, no one's investigated what happened that day. As you know, Khan Chakun's under the control of al-Nusra Front, which is a branch of al-Qaeda. The only information the world has had has been made public by al-Qaeda. No one has any other information. Well, that's just disingenuous. Um, first of all, al-Nusra is not al-Qaeda, at least anymore. Do you, do you think that may be a, a point of pedantry, though? Well, I remember... Hasn't um, the Idlib province changed a bit since the split with Al-Qaeda? 
Uh, well, since it was under the command of Al Nusra, it was um, Al Nusra was trying. I think to enforce, I remember uh, a very literal interpretation of Sharia law, but they were finding it difficult due to resistance from the people mm. living in Idlib. So, because I rem there have been changes since the split with um, between Al Nusra and Al Qaeda. Yeah, there, there have. I mean, it, it's more about pragmatic day to day running. I think. But um, Rather than the US doesn't difference. recognize a functional difference between them, so it might just be pedantry. Yeah. I, 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 and things, I agree with you, but it, I, it does sound like pedantry, doesn't it? Yeah, I just wish... Come on, this is your country, Assad. Know about the different factions. I, well, I'm i sure he does, but maybe it's the same like Americans call liberals, progressives liberals. Anyone on the left is a liberal. Uh, well, he calls all of the opposition terrorists. Well, most of them are. Most of them are now, yes. They didn't used to be. Maybe it's been a slow takeover, but there is a. We're at a point now. This is again where I differ with Vernaculus. Mm -hmm. We're at a point now where most of the opposition is terrorists. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's not really, with the possible exception of the Syrian Democratic Forces, but even they have. Yeah. The the I imagine that there was during say the you know the, around the time of the Arab Spring. I imagine there was some sort of popular movement against Assad, and I can believe that he didn't deal with these in a kind way. But there also were huge numbers of Islamists who were obviously laying dormant in the country. And there were also loads and loads yeah, of... Uh, Assad, this is interesting. Assad has welcomed, apparently, this is just according to a Vox video that I watched mm -hmm. overviewing the whole conflict, so don't trust it. But according to that... They're actually not that bad, Fox. As apparently, Assad welcomes those Islamists into Syria because they undermine the democratic cause of the rebels. Well, seems like a, one of those things. It's, I've got a rat in the, uh, the, the garage. What am I going to do? Put a snake in there? <laughs> you know, it, it, <laughs> well, well, with every the rat problem that comes in, into what? Syria, it gets harder for the US to fund the opposition. It gets more politically unpopular. Hmm. Um, but so I've got some. Um, I've got a report that was prepared by the Congressional Research Service. I haven't seen that. Right. Yeah. This is interesting. I mean, um, they, basically, they, they this. I'll, I'll just give you the main points because it's quite long. Obviously, but they've they've got them bullet pointed. So the first one is the Syrian conflict is between Islamists and secularists, not between Sunnis and Alawites. Because there are a lot, there are lots of, and I think that's really important because there are a lot of people who, in I, and I think a lot of the time they're kind of confusing having a detailed knowledge of Islam with the situation in Syria. Well, practically speaking, the whole Middle East has been divided between Sunni and Shia, but in the, in the context yeah. of Syria itself, yeah. it is Sunni v secularism because Assad is Shia in a a majority Sunni country, so he has to be a secularist. Yeah, and so the, I I agree. With, I I think it's likely that the Syrian conflict is a conflict between Islamists and secularists. Um, it he keeps dropping out. Um, but yeah, I I I do think that that's probably the case. Um, I just disconnected and reconnected again. Yeah, I saw. Uh, so point two is the Syrian opposition coalition is dominated by Islamists and allied with the foreign enemies of Syria. What do you make of that? Say again? The Syrian opposition coalition is dominated by Islamists and is allied with the foreign enemies of Syria. Uh, now, that is true-ish. Yes, mostly. Uh, I agree. I, I agree. There's really that. not much of a democratic opposition left. No. Um, and I, I don't think that <laughs> I don't think one's going to emerge from the Islamists. Um, and the thing is, we we've seen uh, like we, I mean we've we've seen loads of reports from areas occupied by the Islamists, mm. and there is very little difference between the Islamic State and Al Nusra and whatever other Islamist minor factions are around. They they all seem to be trying to implement incredibly strict versions of Sharia. They they yeah. seem to be Quranic literalists. I actually had a message from um, Tom Holland, the historian, the other day. Did you? Um, yeah, he, he told me about a documentary he'd done for Channel 4 um, and about 
uh, how Islamic is the Islamic State? And Tom Holland is... He, wrote the, he quite literally wrote the book on Islam. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he quite literally did. I've, I think I've read practically everything he's done other than the Ethel Stan book that he put out. So, I it, Tom, if you listen book. to this, I, I, I've just got to get I, I want the Ethel Stan book. Like, um, my, my forte is modern history. I want to go back a bit pre-enlightenment. I want to read some ancient history. Oh, it's it's brilliant, uh, ancient history. Uh, it's it's really fascinating because I won't get into it. But anyway, um, basically, I, he he said that, oh, you, you'll probably find this very interesting. I was like, I will. Um, so if I had to guess, I'd say that the Islamic State are Quranic literalists. And he said, you're very warm, but you'll have to watch it to find out. And I haven't got around to watching it. I'll probably do that tonight. Um, but it, basically, I think that's essentially the case, is they're yeah. going to be Quranic Hadith literalists. Um, they're they're going to be exceptionally Islamic. And the, this is what I love about Tom Holland, right? He, he's not full of shit. He's not full of shit. He is honest. <laughs> and that's all you have to be when you talk about Islam. Just be honest. Yeah. He, he genuinely is. If it, you guys should follow him on Twitter because he's also a bit of a shit lord. I follow him. He's uh yeah for for people listening. He's um every now and again he'll um post a and a very amusing tweet <laughs> to someone that you probably will find. Yeah, did you know? Um, did you hear about what happens when you blow up sarin? Uh, well, I from one of the uh, one of the experts consulted. Apparently, it vaporizes. Yeah, that's. An important crux of the issue that completely undermines the Russian narrative, but it also undermines one of Assad's own points. Oh, what's that? Um, it's uh, they attacked that. I'm quoting from the the interview. Interviewer: The Pentagon said there were chemical weapons in the airbase. You deny that, and then Assad says they attacked that airbase and they destroyed the depots containing different materials, and there was no sarin gas at all. They said that we launched the sarin attack from the airbase. What happened to the sarin when they attacked the depot? Did we hear about any sarin? Our chief of staff was there only a few hours later. How could he go there if there was sarin? You have hundreds of soldiers and officers working there, and there was sarin, but they didn't die. And this is why I think Assad is being a bit deceptive, because the consensus seems to be, blow up sarin, and it doesn't ignite, it's destroyed. See, now, I, I honestly don't know. I, I I do not I honestly I mean I looked up the effects of sarin gas and I looked up as much as I could find, but I couldn't find anything that was scientific to tell me what the problem was. Uh, oh. what, what 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 would happen in that eventuality? Oh, I did. Um, this is a paragraph from um, I can't remember where it was from, but it was written by Dan Kazetza, who's the managing director of Strong Point Security Limited. Uh, da, 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 um, I think that's the guy I was quoting. Yeah, it's because it, it's binary mixing. Um, yeah, yeah. Most chemical ammunition can be described as unit. This is from the OPCW. Yeah, no, I, th I think that was the guy I was quoting. That's what yeah. I said, the expert. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the guy. It can be described as unitary, which mm -hmm. implies it contains one active. Blimey, his connection's a pain, isn't it? <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I read that report as well. Um, yeah, so it, essentially the conclusion was that it blows up and is vaporized. Um, I don't know how true that is, but either way, the Russian narrative is certainly nonsense. Um, right, I don't know how long it's going to be till he gets back. Uh, so I'll just carry on with this and uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, so the third point is that the political uh, the political opposition coalitions appear to lack grassroots support. Oh, are you back, uh, hobbyist? Possibly. I'm not hearing anything from you if you're talking. Which I assume you are trying to. Uh, do you want to type in the side chat to let me know you can hear me or something? Ah, I heard something. Oh, oh God, really? Was that yes. all missed? Yes, right. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I'm happy to agree that Sarin probably is vaporized when it blows up. Yeah, because um, there's people that... So that destroys the Russia argument completely, yes, because there was absolutely. some guy the BBC interviewed who said that axiomatically it's destroyed. Yeah, I, d I, don't, like, I don't like that argument, though. That's... Um, that's not necessarily true. And, and I'm, I'm not saying it's not true. 
um, to say that well, axiomatically, if you blow something up, you destroy it. Well, that's that's talking about the definitions of the words that we're using to describe the event. We might not be describing the event correctly. So, yeah. uh, you know, I didn't like that argument, but I'm happy to agree that it probably doesn't just like yeah. So seep everywhere. That was a sad saying that he made the argument. Oh, there was no sarin in the airbase. If it was, my chief of staff would have died. Yeah, he's probably lying. Um, the Syrian government and that's why gas. you said earlier that his narrative was internally consistent. Well, here's an example of where it's wrong. Well, yeah, I didn't say it was correct on every point. I know. It doesn't have to be to be internally consistent. It's This is why I said he's a bit deceptive. His narrative is perfectly yeah, internally the, the, consistent, but the, the how much thing, of it is lies? Yeah, well, that's well, that's the thing. I mean, there, there, is, there is every reason for them to lie about having sarin gas. Uh, I don't. I can't remember which interview it was in. I can't remember. If it was twenty thirteen? I think it was the twenty thirteen interview that he had, um, where he that he he kept saying, "I don't want to comment on this, whether Syria has sarin gas or not. It's a military issue. This is classified." But the uh, the, the interview kept pressing him, and he re- basically uh, I can't remember exactly how he said it, but th- to paraphrase, he was saying that we have these stores of sarin gas because <laughs> I've had a I've, I've had a comment on my blog. Um, F four C K. My wife says Sargoy is a cuck. <laughs> That's a good comment. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I'm absolutely sure that Syria does have sarin. Oh, gas. Of course it does. Um, yeah, but... and I, th- I, I think there's a, a fairly easy explanation as to why why Assad would lie about that because they had previously said they had gotten rid of all of their sarin. But isn't it um, isn't it stupid though? He must have known that you blow sarin up, you destroy it. He must have known that we would know. I, I don't know, but I don't... I mean, is it really a particularly important point? I think he's just trying to cover his ass. Yeah, after, it's after it's an important point about Assad. It's not really important in the context of the attack. Hmm. Well, I agree. I, I mean, I, I can see why he would do it as well. There is at least a note of that. Um, so, right, point three on this uh, this list is... Political opposition coalitions appear to lack grassroots support. Now, everything I've seen coming out of Syria from uh, sort of citizen journalists uh, would corroborate that. That It seems that the Syrian people don't particularly like living under um, an Islamist regime. Uh, Assad is ostensibly an elected leader. I'm not sure how democratic he is. Yeah, but the thing is... Do we know how, how democratic the Syrian elections are? No, we don't. No, we've we've got no particular. So, because um, um, <laughs> the Soviet Union always held elections. Well, yes, yes, they did. Um, I, uh, but I don't know. It might be. Yeah, I but, mean, you could always make the argument that look, if you've got a bunch of foreign jihadis coming into your country and you've got the Islamic State on your doorstep, and Assad is in control of the army and promising to destroy yeah. the terrorists, why wouldn't you vote for him? That's why um, he likes that the Islamists are coming in, because they undermine, well, they have undermined, they've already done it, there's no democratic opposition left. Well, that's a fair point. I I can't imagine, I I can't imagine that it's worth the risk, though. Well, this is I can't imagine this, I can't imagine he's really looking at this thinking, well, at least I'm going to get elected again. (laughs) It's, it keeps dropping out. But yeah, I, I, that seems a little too cynical for me. But I mean, maybe. Good. Who knows? Right. Since uh, since we're waiting, where's the fourth point? Three. Where is point four? Let's go straight to point five. Okay. I oh, know point four. Uh, a moderate opposition doesn't exist. The United States is trying to build one to act as its partner. Um, you're going to be shocked to hear this, guys. But the people opposing Assad are psychotic Islamist rebels. And I say rebels, quote-unquote, because many of them are foreign. So many of them are jihadi fighters who are trying to establish their caliphate, and we're supporting them, (laughs) just saying that this is what's happening. Um, I don't know where the hobby is coming back, so let's carry on. Uh, Point five, the United States is arming sectarian terrorists indirectly and possibly directly and covertly. (laughs) God, who's surprised about this? Just, I don't mean to laugh, but it's just like, oh god, the US is so evil sometimes. I mean, oh god, it's just so terrible. 
Uh, point six: Washington wants to contain ISIS but not eliminate it in order to maintain a military in order to blah, 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 in order to maintain military pressure on the Syrian government. I can completely believe that. Um, Hillary Clinton kept going on about not, and we're not talking about the Kurds here either. She wanted to expand the um, the supply programs, and you've had people from Al Nusra, like commanders from Al Nusra, who have said that they demand um, weapons and various other armaments from the West, otherwise they're going to tell them all the horrible secrets that they know and things like this. Uh, it wouldn't be surprising to me in the slightest if we did end up arming them. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that we've done this. For example, we armed Saddam, we armed the Mujahideen, and I imagine we've armed many others in South America, and I say we, meaning America, really. Um, in various factions in South America, we deposed the Shah of Iran, uh, the the elected government of Iran and, and installed the Shah. I mean, th this is just something that the US and the Western powers do. So this, it would not surprise me at all if this was true. And if, if I had to put money on it, I would just assume that this was true. This would just be something I would take as given. Um, so the conclusion, the report says that in the absence of grassroots support for political opposition coalitions in Syria, the United States is relying on a number of tactics to pressure the current government in Syria to step down, including keeping ISIS alive as a tool to sustain military pressure on the Damascus. Right, right, right. Uh -huh. My internet jihadded. I can see that. It, no, it was odd. Um, I tried to rejoin twice, and um, it said I needed to download Hangouts. <laughs> I don't know. Thanks very much, Google. But it worked on third attempt. Right, okay. So um, just uh, I'll, I'll just go over points uh, four, five, and six, because th these are... These are things. Sorry that about that. Fucking jihadist in the Wi Fi. Yeah. So, um, point number four. Um, so, yeah, point number three is the opposition lacks grassroots support. Uh, point number four is a moderate opposition does not exist. The United States is trying to build one to act as its partner. Anything contentious with that for you? No, I completely agree. Yes. Um, right, so point five, the United States is arming sectarian terrorists indirectly and possibly directly and covertly. The United States has been cautious about who it arms, more so than Turkey, but they have done that, yes. Yeah. Uh, the, re the report points out that not only is the Pentagon openly trained and equipped rebels, but the United States has also covertly armed them. According to, the Congress, uh, according to congressional researchers, Secret then Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel says in 2013, in, in September 2013, hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that the administration was taking steps to provide arms to some Syrian rebels under covert action authorities. Also, it was June of this year, 2013, that the president made the decision to support lethal assistance to the opposition. We, the Department of Defense, have not been involved in this. As you know, this is a covert action. So it seems pretty cut and dried from what they're saying there. Yeah. Um, point six, Washington wants to contain ISIS but not eliminate it in order to maintain military pressure on the Syrian government. Oh, now that's conspiratorial, but it might be true, actually. There's it's, some... not, it's not so much conspiratorial as it is speaking to the interests and desires. It makes the sense. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I have never thought about that. I, I think it's probably true. I, I, it, it's entirely beneficial to the United States if they want to overthrow the Syrian government to have ISIS do it for them. This is the thing with, with conspiracies. Conspiracies happen. It's it's ridiculous to think they don't. Yeah. Politicians do get together in secret circles in darkly lit rooms and talk about things they're going to lie about. It does happen. Yeah. We just have to... Um, you have to be discerning. Yeah. But the, the, this... I mean, I, it's hard it's to even call this a conspiracy. It's crisis. That was a conspiracy. Well, it's it's hard to even call this a, a conspiracy per se because it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be something they do. This is effectively something they don't do, um, and so they can just take a position of really kind of non-intervention with ISIS, and the problem uh, and the situation continues as they want. And it would be really don't... interesting to see how they taking to mean the, the military industrial complex, yeah, the deep yeah. state, all of that, yeah. how how they would have reacted to a yeah. Clinton just, or a just, to, just to specify, the, the, 
I, I hate using the term they because that is a conspiratorial yeah. slippery. So they, you know. it's a conspiratorial so meme. Just, just to be clear, we're, we're talking, I can't name the individuals because I don't know exactly who's the government is impersonal. But um, yeah, I mean, Joe, Wesley Clark said that the US had been taken over by a foreign policy coup. And he pointed directly at the neocons and the project from the American uh, New American Century. And undoubtedly, we can link that to the CIA and presumably a bunch of other governmental branches and organizations of similar ilk. Um, so this isn't entirely nebulous they. We actually do have a fairly good idea of who we're talking about. And people, I mean, Hillary Clinton was deeply embedded with these people. So Hillary Clinton was, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she she um and the the Council on Foreign Relations as well, um that that's another one of these organisations that I think is directly involved. When we say military industrial complex, that's what we're referring to. Um, yeah. Just so people understand. Um, so I'll just read the um, conclusion of this article talking about the reports because uh, the report's quite long. Obviously. Um, so the report says that in the absence of grassroots support for political opposition coalitions in Syria. The United States is relying on a number of tactics to pressure the current government in Syria to step down, including keeping ISIS alive as a tool to sustain military pressure on Damascus, arming jihadist groups indirectly, and we can assume directly, albeit covertly, to pressure Assad, seeking to create a moderate opposition that will act as a US partner, good fucking luck, trying to co-opt parts of this... Oh, five years ago, maybe, not today. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, trying to co-opt parts of the existing Syrian state to take a partnership role in governing a post-Assad Syria. Um, mm. I can believe all that. I think that's sounds like with what sounds like decent intentions. I guess utterly unworkable. Yes, yeah, that, that's a, that, I'm glad glad you came to that because one of the things that I mean is the the perennial question: Who's going to replace Assad? This is the thing I've always said. Um, the only way you're going to bring peace to, to Syria or to Iraq or to any Middle Eastern country is to fucking annex it or make it into a protectorate. Oh, I don't even know if that'll happen. I don't, I don't, I mean, you, I mean, you're I'm still really thinking. With a, I mean, when the US was occupying Iraq, they still suffered from vast amounts of terrorism from both jihadis and nationalists. But the US is actually going to have to act like the imperial power it pretends not to be yes. if it wants to bring peace to the middle east which i don't think it should even try to do no I if it wants to achieve that goal it's going to have to start taking countries over long term do you know what i find frustrating about the whole thing though is that um i don't like that the the us is trying to overthrow secular governments to the benefit of islamists i, I really uh, don't like that even if they're allied with russia even if they're not is, led it's, by the, good it's the tony blair mentality I hold that Tony Blair is not a warmonger. What he is, is a very dangerous, very moral faggy Christian. <laughs> Tony Blair confirmed for moral fag. He is. Oh, he absolutely is. You're right. That's I, the thing. He had this idea yeah. in his head. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to save Britain. I've got this great new popular movement. I've saved the Labour Party. I'm going to save Britain. I'm going to save the whole fucking world. I'm going to build the new Jerusalem. He's that kind of man. He could well have been completely delusional. You're right. I mean, it yeah. would, it would certainly, it would certainly I, go I've somewhere. His, to, I've read his, uh, um, Anthony Selston's biography of him. And really, he's a moral fag. That's where his attitude comes from. It's not like George Bush. George Bush is a warmonger. Yes. Tony Blair is not a warmonger. He's a moral fag. Hmm. And he wants to make the world a better place. He badly wants to make the world a better place. And in order to do that, he's willing to overthrow secular regimes. See, it really bothers me. Uh, because, like, whenever you see, whenever you see someone who is uh, of the opposition and they're being presented in a neutral or flattering light. I can't help but look at this guy with a huge beard in traditional Islamic garb and think he's not our friend. You know, this person is not, this is, this person is operating with us out of interest. Yes. You've got someone like Assad who, where was Assad educated? Was it Switzerland? Oh, um, I, he spent a lot of time in London, didn't he? Or oh, I just London. invented that. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was, he was educated in the West. He wears suits. His wife wears, Western clothing, people aren't forced to wear burqas under his regime. 
And, and I'm just looking at it thinking, is that really a worse option? <laughs> he doesn't have to be a good man. It's his circumstances force him to be a secularist. His circumstances force him to be conciliatory. He yeah, doesn't have to be fine. good, but yeah. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I'm not saying he's good. But what I mean is he is secular, you know, and yeah. he, he has to be. He's in a and city majority country. country. You've got to be. And I, I think that's more beneficial for Syria in general than to allow it to backslide into regressive Islamist uh, control. I, I mean, either, e even if how many how many historical examples do we need? Yeah, exactly. Do you want another Iran? You know, no, <laughs> of course not. You know, this it's horrific. <laughs> and so yeah, I, I I don't. And the thing is, Assad is an ally of Russia because it's beneficial to be an ally of Russia. Why not just make it beneficial to be an ally of the United States? Why do we have to be at odds? Why what, can we not seduce him away from Russia? Um, oh, we, there would have to be big changes in the attitude of the West for that. Absolutely, that's but that's the point, isn't it? It's just I the mean, attitude. The way that Boris Johnson behaved. Um, <laughs> God, I'm trying to find it. I quote it. I'm trying to find it. Um, I, don't know. I love Boris Johnson. I think he's yeah. hilarious. I, I find him very Michael but yeah, I, I don't want him being a fucking foreign minister. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. <laughs> he made a better mayor of London than Sadiq Khan, though. That's true. That's true. Oh, here we go. Uh, Russia faces a choice, he said. It can, I, it can continue acting as a lifeline for Assad's murderous regime, or it could live up to its responsibilities as a global power and use its influence over the regime to bring six long years of failed ceasefires and false storms to an end. I mean, just look at that. Look at that self-righteous rhetoric. Yeah, but it, it's like Boris. You know, he's not fighting against like pacifists and stuff, right? He's not. <laughs> he's, he's fighting. Jews. He, he's yeah, exactly. He's fighting against people who would literally call for the death of all the Jews, and he's fighting against the sort of people who behead children. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm sure Assad. I mean, you know, I'm sure if like there's a journalist. I mean, I I, I see Assad being very much in the same vein as Vladimir Putin. If there's a journalist who's going to release some terrible dossier on some backroom dealing or something, that journalist, I'm sure, just disappears. You know, I'm, I've got no doubt that Assad oh, yeah. just removes and disappears. It's, threats it's to his Vladimir but, Putin's opposition leaders just keep disappearing. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. I've got no doubt that that's the case, and that's terrible. You know, that's awful in a democratic society, but that's par for the course in authoritarian eastern regimes that's just what happens mm. and so it's and i'm not trying to be moral relativist but i'm i'm just saying it's it's not as bad as what would replace it and uh, so it's, I mean, it's, you least, it's come on channel your inner machiavelli well you, you've got to be pragmatic haven't you, uh. you if, if you're just looking at like i mean the, the people in idlib when they were given like the description of life under al nusra it was horrific Absolutely horrific. It was every bit as oppressive as you can imagine. You know, it sounded it sounded like Saudi Arabia, and it was just like, okay. Well, this can't be allowed. You know, I mean, at least okay. You you don't get you're not free under Assad in a political sense, but you're not oppressed in the same way that you would be under a, an Islamic state, and that's I think not. the difference. For the average Syrian, um, you can see why they'd support Assad. Just, I just want to clear the air slightly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul Litvenko. That's um someone sent me that. Someone just sent me the um <laughs> the vanilla picture and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna turn down the exposure, turn up the contrast, and write that over it. I tell you what, right, that that, that whole incident was very interesting, wasn't it? it from uh, from the why, why polonium? Why use that? That he must have known that that was going to be he found. He was probably making a statement. Exactly, he must have been making a statement. And the, the things they say about Assad, I think, are true about Putin. You know, I think he does consider himself to be beyond reproach in many of these regards. He 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 knows the U.S. isn't going to invade Russia. Oh yeah, he knows that he can get away with things. Exactly, but I don't think Assad has got that kind of uh, sort of leisure of thought at all. Assad can't possibly think, "Oh, the U.S. is never going to invade." This is why you should all follow me on Twitter.
That's the sort of thing I do. But the, the, this is the thing. I, th I think that people are projecting onto Assad what they think about Putin. Um, and it's well, because there, there are some important comparisons you can make. Sure, there are. There are. But the, 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 the position that each one is in is completely different. Yeah. They're, they're not they're not the same at all. I don't, I don't think they're going Putin, Putin is secure in his position. Assad yeah. is fighting desperately for his. Yeah. Assad has, has been hanging under the sword of Damocles for well, years. Also, isn't there a contradiction in um, Akkad, but Assad? A contradiction? Sorry, say again. The way you're pronouncing them. Uh, yeah, Akkad, Akkad, yeah. I, I don't know why. I... <laughs> it's, it's, it's a sad for me, because um, Akkad is natural. It might just be because I've been watching it since fucking July 2015 or something, but I wanted to go over... Um, um, a sad sounds wrong. <laughs> a sad. A sass. A sass. sass. I, I've got to kind of pull my nose up when I say it. I don't... Sad. I don't know. Well, I, I think it's laziness now that I think about it. It's just well, easier to say sad rather than sad. <laughs> I, um, I wanted to go back to Theodore A. Postel because I think he's amazing. Um, okay, go ahead. And you should read when you... You're going to make another video on it. Um... I think this will do in lieu of doing another. Yeah, thing. well, the work that he's done is he fucking destroyed the White House report released in 2017. He destroyed it. Um, the White House report was terrible, though. It he he ripped it to shreds. It was scathing. Good. Um, Postal. He he was in both 2013 and 2017. Mm -hmm. He attacked both, and um, hello. Yeah, no, I'm here. Oh, thank God. I'm, I'm neurotic now. <laughs> no, 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 I can't. In 2017, uh, he was really compelling. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus of Science, Technology, and National Security at MIT, mm -hmm. weapons expert. He's won awards for debunking claims about missile defense systems, mm -hmm. and he's been scientific advisor to the U.S. Chief of Naval Operations. So this man has credentials. Yeah, he he sounds like an absolutely fascinating man to have a conversation with. Actually, yeah, he's a genius. Basic one, well, no, he's very clever. Yeah, he, he knows a lot about this. He read the White House report when it came out, and he wrote. Uh, he called it a quick turnaround assessment that evening, mm -hmm. and then later on, he added an addendum to it, and then a third letter, and he concludes. This is his genuine quoting the conclusion. The White House report contains false and misleading claims that could not possibly have been accepted in any professional review by impartial intelligence experts. <laughs> and he says it was fabricated without input from the intelligence community. That doesn't surprise me at all. And um, he says no competent analyst would assume the crater cited as the source of the sarin attack was unambiguously an indication that munition came from an aircraft no competent analyst would assume the photograph of the sarin canister was in fact a sarin canister yeah. any competent analyst would have had questions about whether debris were staged or real yeah. no competent analyst would miss the fact the canister was forcefully crushed from above rather than exploded from within all of these highly amateurish mistakes indicate the White House report, like the earlier Obama White House report, was not properly vetted by the intelligence community. Mm -hmm. So, um, holy shit. Right. <laughs> you don't we know exactly. Trump. It's entirely about regime change in the Middle East. Ah, Completely actually, it could have been... Um... um it could have been, this is his thesis, because the White House report came out after the missile strike. It could have been a retroactive justification of Trump's actions. Hmm. Maybe. I think this that's is why generous. I think Trump just reacted emotionally. He had an emotional reaction to the pictures he saw. Ivanka was crying. He thought, fuck it, missile strike. And then his officials wrote this White House report to retroactively justify it. And no one in the intelligence community saw it. It's certainly a thesis that could be true. Yeah, it's... I, I wouldn't rule that out at all. I, I actually, I think that Trump's more clever than that, to be honest. I, I think that he's been playing the game of power politics for his entire adult life. And so I don't think he is going to... He was a lonely billionaire, wasn't he? He was like the outsider when he was a billionaire property yeah. owner. Yeah, that's because he's not, he's not bourgeois. He's, that's the thing. 
He's he's very bad at being bourgeois. It's really this is why this is why he gets along so well with common people. Mm -hmm. He's he he is like them. That's the thing. He's actually like them in his character and in his personality. Like no no, you know, you would never see Obama or Bush going on a Twitter tirade. But Trump he has care. he has that connection with them. Yeah. Like um, this is why John Major won the nineteen ninety leadership election. He has two O levels. That's why he won. <laughs> There is he really? is. I didn't know. Oh, God. I didn't realize he was so poorly educated. No, he um yeah, John Major had two O levels. That's why he won the leadership contest. He connects with ordinary people. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I well it, the thing is it's actually I, it's actually not about your education level. I, I've been thinking about the concept of the bourgeoisie a lot recently. Um You're communist. No, 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 no. You guys are ready to talk to Zeke scene. No, no, no. It's just something that fascinates me because, I mean, I come from the bourgeoisie. You know, my, my family are middle class and they were very... The, the, to be bourgeois is to be concerned with appearances. That's the, the fundamental crux. My of it. upbringing was privileged. I had, um, I had two parents. I had a stable household. I think yeah, that, that's, that's... Well, that's... That's a lot. That should be the default, but yeah, that's... It, it but is I think, privilege. you know, um, single parenthood unstable it, finances R rousseau coined the term bourgeois and uh, bourgeoisie and he his his description of it was fascinating it was um they want to look be looked at and look at others in turn when they're on their own they think of other people and when they're with other people they think of themselves and what he's saying i think is it's all about keeping up appearances and this is why this is why the the lower class try so hard to emulate them I mean, and this, 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 I think, was best summed up by a Terry Pratchett line in a book of his once I read. That um, it, it was. I don't know why this stayed with me, but um, he was talking about uh, Sam Vimes' upbringing, and he was saying how you know they didn't have any food to eat, but the plates were certainly clean and shiny, and uh, that's. But the thing is, I'd seen this loads growing up because my family's really working. It's the aspirational working class. Yes, yes, exactly. If we and it's like interesting people, how it's maybe. changed. Yeah, because we might be there mistaken. was a time when people were proud of being working class. Absolutely. And um, they, well, this is why communism will never take off ever again. It's because there is no working class mentality anymore. Mm. It's yeah. it's gone. The working class is ambitious. It wants to be better. Yeah, and that good and good for it. You know, it, it will improve itself. But um, but the, the the thing what I'm saying is that it's about keep it's about concern with other people's opinions. And so th this is why, like, you know, I'll piss around on Twitter all day, and I'll get people going, "Oh my god, you shouldn't do that." And I'm just like, "Why? <laughs> I don't care about other people's opinions. <laughs> if I, you know, if I, I did, I'd be like Twitter. you. You know, it, I would be just like you if I cared about other people's opinions. So, and this is the thing: Trump doesn't care about other people's opinions either. He's terrible at being bourgeois. He's terrible at it. But he's great at being a salt of the earth guy, even though he's a billionaire. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, he connects with ordinary people. Because um, he doesn't have pretensions. Jordan, this is... Jordan Peterson said this perfectly. Like He was saying how like 95% of a person's personality is dead wood that needs to be burned away. But people obviously don't want to lose 95% of their personality. But if and that 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 ninety five percent is the bourgeois element that make that that's what makes them bourgeois. It's all the it's the, the great the paradox pieces. in the left. Um, did you read? Did you read Niall Ferg? I like Niall Ferguson. He's my favorite historian. Yours yeah. is Tom Holland. I haven't actually read. Did you read, I, I read, I read the Sunday Times of books of his? Did you read his his Empire is great. If you if you only read one Niall Ferguson book, read Empire. I will do. I will do. I, but, he's on my um, but uh, I haven't yet. Did you read? Do you read his Sunday Times column? No. This week, no. Uh, six days ago, he said, um, "Don't just blame Corbyn. Social democracy itself is dead." And it's a very provocative title, and I disagree with it. But his his argument is, the left is dying. It's not just about leaders. Oh the yeah, yeah, yeah why, absolutely is. Absolutely, it's the reason why is because. And I can remember his quotation because I thought it was perfect. It was fucking perfect. The old alliance between the progressive elite and the proletariat is broken. Hmm. Because that's the great paradox in the left. It's fucking elitist. 
Yes, it's it always been fucking elitist, right the way through its history, in a way the right never was. Wow. Let me think about that. Because, I mean, if, well, you, I mean, if you go back to the labor unions in the 70s, a lot of those were quite working class. Well, the unions were, but fucking hell, Ramsay MacDonald uh, establishment, Clement Attlee, born into the governing class, yeah, yeah. Harold Wilson, technocrat grammar school. Yeah, I mean, there, there have always been socialists with guilty consciences. Uh, Michael Foote, um, Tony Benn. A lot of these are, there's exceptions, of course, James Callaghan. Mm -hmm. But by and large, the left has always been elitist. It's always been ruled by elites, always. Um, you can say that for any political party, really. Can't well, you? No, the right has a better, this isn't a defense of the right. It isn't an attack on the left. But really, the right has better examples of social mobility. Benjamin Disraeli, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, John Major again. Margaret Thatcher came from humbler backgrounds than Harold Wilson did. No, no, absolutely. She, she had to take elocution lessons. Because, she, has a, uh, she had an, um, a chemistry degree. <laughs> Good for her. The vicar's daughter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, ab absolutely. I, I remember reading a biography of her. And uh, one, one of the things that was... Uh, pointed out is that there was always an element of class um, snobbery around Thatcher. Uh, not, yeah. not from her point of view, but aimed at her. And uh, I could quite believe it as well. Oh, yeah, she's, um, she's an interesting character. Mm. I could go on about her for hours, but I think we've derailed. Yeah, we, we have somewhat, but I think we've covered um, the subject. Yeah. I, I, think, uh, I think basically... I, I can't imagine why Assad would do it. It would be, I, I don't think I don't think the man's an idiot at all. In fact, I think I think we completely opposite. I think he's a smart man who's very well informed, and it seems that the U.S. and Western powers have got an active interest in dethroning him, and it looks like this is some sort of covert operation in order to do so. That's my opinion so far. I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's um, a covert operation to do so. But again, I do think... But I'm not sure what happened in Kanshaku. Like, for example, like, do, you, do you think that uh, in 2013... The, the, well, it was in 2015 that the Turkish MP came out with this uh, information. But, I mean, do you think he's lying? or do you think Turkey is very suspicious. Turkey oh, yeah, is definitely channeling... He's, he's Turkey not, is definitely he's channeling he's sarin to the rebels, no doubt about it. Yeah. And, and and this is the thing, and so I, and it's not I have any sympathy for Assad that I say this, but I think he's legitimately being set up. Well, I don't know. Um, I mean, this this is a speculative conclusion that I've come to. Yeah, it would have been it. interesting to get vernaculars in on this, but I know he's gone off to do that New Orleans rally thing that I don't know anything about. Oh, I don't, I don't either. I'm looking forward to his uh, video. He's, um, uh, anyway. Hmm. But okay, well, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll stop that. And, and, uh, All right. Yeah, if, I mean, if, if new information comes to light or anything like that, we can certainly do another stream and go through it and whatnot. It has been glorious talking to you. Oh, thank you very much. It's been very entertaining talking Hopefully to you. Hopefully we can do it again, I think. I'm sure we will. I'm following you on Twitter, so I'll get to talk to you, thank you. relatively regularly. Um, uh, what's your, excuse me, what's your uh, Twitter at again so people can? At Hobby Contrarian. It's not hobbyist, it's just hobby. Right, okay. Well, there we go. So everyone can follow you uh, if they'd like to. And thanks for listening.